Good morning, everyone. It, it, this is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee meeting, and it is February 16th. Uh, and we're joined today in committee by Senator McCormick, who's going to give us uh, his introduction to S-74. Um, so, Senator, thank you for being here uh, today, and we appreciate that. So we did have a run through of the bill um, just briefly last week, but we felt it really important that you as lead sponsor be here to give us the reasons for, for the bill introduction, so. Thank you, Madam President. I have submitted- Oh, I just got promoted, but I'll take Madam, it. Madam, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Madam, <laughs> Madam Chair, I have, I've submitted uh, written testimony, but I'll, I think I'll speak more uh, front spontaneously. First, it's good to be back in the committee. I served on this committee for many years with Senator Cummings and with the chair uh, under the, at that time, the chairmanship of uh, Senator Claire Ayer, uh, who is successor from Madison County is now on the committee. So there's certain continuity here. Uh, I have been out of the Senate for several years as a private citizen uh, before coming back and serving on this committee. And during that time, I also, much of the work I did was as a private, uh, in the private sector as an organizer on the same issue of uh, patient choice at the end of life. Uh, and I think the best work we did during my time on this committee was getting um, th that bill, the patient choice bill passed. We. Um, we modeled the bill, which is now the law, uh, on what was already an existing law in the state of Oregon. And uh, the reason for that is that at the time that Vermont was considering uh, this policy, uh, it had already been the policy in Oregon for several years and had worked well. And much of the opposition, some of the opposition was purely philo philosophical that uh, the argument was that, that this is uh, a choice for God, not for the patient, and so on. And those kinds of philosophical uh, decisions devolve to the question, really, what is the proper role of the state? We have never made a judgment on whether it is moral or, or proper or good in the eyes of God to, uh, to, to hasten death. But rather, uh, the, 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 the matter for us was, what is the proper role? of government in the matter. And uh, if there is a, uh, the will of God is a question, well, then it's up to the individual patient and his or her beliefs. Am I being waved Yeah. I voted against the bill and you are not characterizing my opposition correctly. That wasn't well, the total, just to be clear, there were other reasons to oppose the bill. Just, yeah, that's, that was that's one was, of them, but there were others. That's that's where I was going, actually. <laughs> okay. Okay. I said that the uh, the philosophical uh, reasons, uh, uh, ultimately, we had to, the, the, the state made a choice. But the other widespread opposition, most of the opposition, uh, and this is not to accommodate um, my friend, Senator Cummings. This is, in fact, where I was, what is in my written testimony as well. The, um, the uh, opposition was conjectural because uh, we were going into something new. And uh, just as the benefits were somewhat conjectural, so too were the, um, uh, the opposition. What if, what if there are greedy grandchildren? hastening grandma's death so they can inherit sooner? What if uh, the patient is, is, is superannuated and not really totally in possession of, of his or her uh, uh, faculties? What if uh, uh, the, the prospect of imminent death is so depressing that the patient really isn't thinking clearly? What if the patient is being pressured? And um, those what ifs were conjectural, but perhaps worthy of being taken seriously. Uh, similarly, uh, any benefits were, were conjectural, at least at the time that Oregon was considering their bill when they first passed it, because it was a, um, it was uncharted territory. And so um, they did not powerfully resist the what ifs 
they responded to the what ifs with safeguards. And a major characteristic of the Oregon law was that it not only provided a dying patient with the option of, 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 of hastening death under that, that his or her choice, it provided a body of safeguards, various steps that had to be taken before that could happen. And those steps were all designed around the, um, the perceived problems. Uh, and indeed, those same conjectures were raised in the, the Vermont debate. And uh, the response of those of us advancing the bill was to allude to those safeguards. Now we're several years down the road and the, um, the law, both in Oregon and uh, in Vermont and now in several other states as well, uh, has been that the law has worked well, that the perceived problems have not presented themselves and largely it's because of those safeguards or at least the safeguards as the term safeguard implies, uh, guarantee that, 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 they, that the uh, feared problems not present themselves. What this bill does is it responds to the experience of, uh, of the, the several years that this has been the law uh, to identify some details of mechanizing these safeguards that uh, do not, uh, have been shown to not be necessary and in fact have been shown to uh, make it more, more difficult uh, to, uh, uh, for a patient to fully access the benefits offered by the law. Uh, would you like me to go through the bill or I see that, that, that Jen is here who, is, who drafted it. I presume the other one, if you yeah. wanna have, oh, I, will get, I will get into the details if, you, if the chair prefers. I, I think um, rather than get into the specific details, if you could give us um, kind of the thumbnail sketch of what the bill does. I know there are about three very important changes made uh, to the process. And so okay. if you could just, you know, just give a highlight of those. And then when we go through the bill, um, we'll identify yes. them again with Jen. Okay, section one removes the requirement that a request for a prescription be made in person, allowing for requests to be made via telemedicine when appropriate. This requirement, I point out telemedicine was not even on the table when we passed this. I guess it was talked about in theory, but it was not in legislation, it was not in law. Uh, the, um, this requirement, this requirement has been burdensome to very sick people for whom it's difficult to go physically to a doctor's office. By removing the requirement that the patient's oral requests be made, are made, quote, in the physical presence, quote, of the doctor, the law would align with best medical practice, allowing tele telemedicine when appropriate. Currently, Vermont is the only state in which physical visits uh, are required for aid in dying. In all other areas of medical practice, Vermont law allows the use of telemedicine based on Medicaid, uh, me based on medical judgment and standards of appropriate practice. The bill also removes the requirement that the prescribing doctor him or herself do a physical uh, exam when the doctor is able to make the necessary and required uh, de determinations through telemedicine and, cl and clinical review. Telemedicine was only a theory of, I'm re reading my prepared remarks, I'd already written that. Uh, section, oh, and then also section two clarifies liability protections. But section one also makes a slight adjustment in the Act 39 time, timeline. The proposed amendment keeps the mandate of 15 day waiting period, but removes an unnecessary and burdensome additional 48 hour delay period after the second oral request. The last step in the process before a prescription can be written. The additional period creates an added burden for those individuals who have already invested a significant amount of energy in the process during a very difficult time. Uh, 
The total of the 15 days and the 48 hours makes Vermont's aid Act 39 timeline one of the longest among the 10 jurisdictions that have made, that have uh, uh, these laws. The amendment would delete the 48 hour delay. Section two clarifies that acting in accordance with the law would protect all parties involved in its use from claims of liability. Current law explicitly provides immunity only for doctors involved in the process. The Attorney General's office has opined that immunity for other providers involved in Act 39, and specifically pharmacists, is implied in the law. However, some pharmacists in Vermont are not satisfied with implicit immunity and have re required doctors to sign onerous indemnification agreements prior to fill, filling prescriptions for their patients. Other state laws, uh, immunity, and, and have required doctors to sign onerous indemnification agreements prior uh, to, to filling prescriptions for their patients. Other state laws, uh, immunities, have required, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting lost in my text. Other state laws, uh, covering these laws pro provide immunity for all persons who comply in good faith with the, uh, the, with the law. This amendment makes what is implicit explicit. So that's, that's the bill. Thank you. Um, uh, just so what I'm hearing you say is that um, the provisions, the proposed changes in the bill uh, help to bring Vermont law more in line with other, what other states are currently doing. I mean, would that be a, an appropriate characterization? Uh, in line with what other states are doing, also uh, somewhat updating telemedicine, as I say, was something talked about in the halls, but it was not in law, it was not in legislation. We did that a lot of telemedicine just very recently. And, uh, uh, and to make, uh, to, to remove uh, unnecessary impediments to the patients. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. the, so questions for Senator McCormick. Senator Hooker, no. Okay. I do. Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you disappeared. Well, I'm trying to use my iPad for the first time. So this well, is. We'll be so patient. Different. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Senator McCormick, um, when you talk about telemedicine, obviously you're talking about video. We're not talking audio, audio only, which oh, is another topic uh, that we're covering. Well, I. I I, I don't know if the bill explicitly says it, but, but that's certainly my understanding. Yeah, because, I mean, if you're going to do an exam, you, you want to see something. But it's yeah. also, but it also can involve just looking at the medical record as well. I mean, that, that, that's uh, lo looking at, at, uh, at, at what, what has already been researched, what are test results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I guess I'd be a little concerned if, um, audio only were include um, looking at their, getting a, a sense of what Senator Cummings perhaps was opposed to in the initial bill, um, the types of things that could happen. So, and, and at some point, I'd like to hear from Senator Cummings about what your concerns were when the bill was first brought up. So I want us to be very cautionary about going back to the underlying bill. Uh, if the concerns relate to the current proposed changes, then that's one thing. But I, uh, I don't want to resurrect the, um, the arguments that were in place that, uh, for, the, for, the underlying, uh, for the underlying bill. Right now, I, I think your issue around audio only versus audio visual is a very good issue for us to bring up as we look at the bill. Uh, but um, it, I, I just want to caution us that this is not about, <laughs> you know, removing the underlying, the underlying statute. Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that, uh, that might be a good conversation offline with yep. Senator Cummings, but um and, and I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt that thought, but I do think 
we need to stay focused on what S seventy four does and what it does not do. So, thank you. All right. Um, other questions for Senator McCormick. Senator Hardy. Thank you, um, Senator McCormick. I'm just wondering if you have heard from people for whom these have been barriers, these various um, waiting periods or access issues, or um, if it's, uh, you're just making the assumption that they are barriers. No, I, uh, when we passed the uh, patient choice law, the people, the, pr the private uh, uh, citizens who had been uh, organized in support of that policy uh, formed an organization, which is uh, End of Life Choices and uh, in Vermont. And they monitor uh, the conduct of the law and the experience of, of people using the law. And uh, they actually had, had raised the issue with me. Uh, so uh, I, I would expect that the committee would hear from them at some point. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, yeah, uh, exactly. That this is the beginning of our testimony, but we will have those folks in and others who uh, have an interest in the, the bill itself. Uh, any other questions for Senator McCormick? Wow. You Before I leave, see you did a great job, yeah. Senator. Thank, Thank you. you. As a point of personal privilege, since I'm here, before I leave, I would like to say I am well now one hour into the effort to get my COVID vaccine appointment, and the Health and Welfare Committee might want to lean on the Health Department a little bit <laughs> to get <laughs> a more uh, workable uh, system. Well, you'll have a chance tomorrow to ask that question of the commissioner. I'm, I'm not sure that we can dive into all the software issues that exist out there. If we did, we'd be here all day, but your point is very well taken. There are a lot Thank of you. people who've had difficulty. Uh, Senator Terenzini. Thanks, Senator Lyons. I was just going to mention, since you uh, mentioned it, Senator McCormick, uh, Senator Brock in our Republican caucus this morning uh, was very frustrated as well. He, he had been almost an hour trying to get through uh, as well. So it's, it certainly felt uh, in all areas of the state, it seems so. Thank you for that. I don't feel no. so bad. <laughs> no, don't. That, that actually, uh, when you think about it, it could be the good news with the bad news. The good news being that people are so interested in making appointments that there's a, a backlog. So, but uh, we don't want to go there yet. We want to make sure that the system is totally functional. In defense, I set up my thing yesterday and I got right in today. Um, but I had trouble getting Regis registered in, in and he called and they had him booked in five minutes. Telephone, so, good. I, right. I called and they told me to go to the uh, to the website. They did the first <laughs> time he called. They were not taking calls because they were yeah. inundated. I think it's variable. Today is the first day it's been open for seventy plus, and so yeah. I think the first day is always hard. And you know, Senator Terenzini mentioned Senator Brock. He said in our committee in finance that when he went to get his shot, everything was really smooth. Right. And it went really great. So um, it's it's obviously a mixed uh, situation right now. Some people it's smooth and some people are having a harder time. Regis is just getting his first shot as we speak. Cool. So he was further booked out because he was later getting in. I have one for next Tuesday. All right. Madam Chair, I apologize for getting this started. I, I just no, thought- No, no, this is fine. Always, no, uh, I, I'm trying to get Regis good. registered. It, and even me, it would not take a password that met all their qualifications. It took me a while to find a password, put a lot of symbols in it, swear. <laughs> that was the only way I got through. One symbol did not do it along with one number. All right, well. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee. Thank you, I Senator. remain available to you as, as needed. All thank right, you. Bye -bye. terrific. 
Okay, take care. Um, so, uh, Jen, uh, I think, Jen Carby, are you there? There you are. Uh, so I think um, we have been through S74, but what would be helpful, I think, just for a few minutes, um, and then, because then we want to move on to the flexibility bill uh, to identify for us in the sections of the bill where the proposed changes are and remind us of exactly what they do. So we could pull that bill up together and, and look with, at the, and the, the, I think the outstanding question is on telemedicine. Is it audio only, uh, is audio only allowed or not? So. That's an important question. Sure. Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. So do you want me to put the bill up on the screen? Yeah, that, I think that's that helpful. helpful. Okay, great. All right, so you should be able to see it now. Um, we'll go to the very beginning. So this is S74 and we'll go past the statement of purpose for now because we're really looking at the language. Um, so as Senator McCormick had said, this gets rid of the requirements that these oral requests to the physician be made in the physician's physical presence. So it does not speak to what alternative modalities may be used if physical presence is not required. It doesn't speak to either telemedicine or audio only telephone or something else. Um, it does have to be oral. So it would have to be something that the physician could hear, but it doesn't specify. Um, and just one small clarification, um, there was actually the first telemedicine legislation had been enacted the year before um, this legislation was enacted, although this legislation that the, the uh, patient choice at end of life legislation had been discussed in a number of previous bienniums, um, but actually in the, when it ultimately passed, it was the year following the first year of the um, telemedicine legislation being enacted. So they did coexist, but I don't think it was nearly, telemedicine was not nearly as prevalent as it has been, and certainly since the, the pandemic. Um, so if you are interested in, in looking at removing the physical presence requirement, you may want to think about whether there are certain parameters that you would want to allow, like audio and video together, uh, or if you want to, if you want to be less involved in that. I mean, again, um, look, thinking about the audio only language, there's a lot of emphasis on what's clinically appropriate. So it would have to be clinically appropriate um, to be doing this part of the process um, by audio only telephone if that was the choice that the provider had made. So that may weigh into your calculations as well. So that's the first piece is taking out the physical presence requirement for the oral requests for medication. Um, and then going along with that, the physician's determination that the patient was suffering a terminal condition, taking out the requirement that that be based on the physician's physical examination of the patient. So it's still based on some sort of examination of the patient and a review of the patient's relevant medical records. But it doesn't have to be a personal physical examination. Well, but it does imply some kind of visual. <laughs> I don't know how you have a have an examination. We'll have to hear from the, the from folks about this. Right. I think it would be important to hear from the medical community um, what they would determine to be the appropriate standard of care for an examination of the patient if, if it is not a physical examination. And then we have the um, that waiting period that Senator McCormick spoke about. This is that provision saying that the physician um, has to wait at least 48 hours after the last to occur of several events. Um, and that includes the 15 day waiting period between the two requests, but taking out that 48 hour requirement after the last of those to occur before the physician writes the prescription. And then lastly, we have the section two um, more general immunity not specific to physicians as is um, what's specific, explicit in the bill. Uh, he was talking about making the implicit explicit. This is that language saying that no one would be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action for acting in good faith compliance with the provisions of the chapter. I have a, I have a question here. Um, is, this, um, is this something that 
the Judiciary Committee in any way should um, look at as, the, as we're going through the bill? That's a good point. I think they had looked when, when the original law had passed, I think they had looked a fair amount at the uh, immunity language. So it might be, right. you know, I, I will leave that uh, up to you either yeah. officially or unofficially to consult with the chair there and yeah. find out if that's something they would want to look at. Yeah. We'll do that. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. May I ask a question of, of Jen? Oh, no, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned the um, provision that's actually in our audio only bill, and I don't want to conflate the two too much, but it's kind of relevant to both about the, the um, clinically appropriate. Mm -hmm. And I think that makes a lot of sense to have here as well, my own personal opinion. But um, I'm wondering in both instances, is it the physician who determines what's clinically appropriate? appropriate how who who get who makes that call yeah I think it's a good question I think in the um in the immediate timing it would be up to the physician to you know in the, in the moment to make the determination about what's clinically appropriate but I think that can play out in in further events in a couple of ways if there was a malpractice claim brought they would probably be looking at whether it was clinically appropriate and what the you know what the appropriate standard of care is within the medical community um, for whether it was appropriate to have delivered care in that way. And then also for um, insurance or Medicaid reimbursement, um, they, could, they could potentially decline to pay for something if they did not deem it to be clinically appropriate. And that's why there's in the audio only language, some requirements for documenting the physician to, or provider to document the reason that they thought it was clinically, that they determined it was clinically appropriate to deliver the services using audio only telephone so that there would be that um, information immediately available if there was an audit or, uh, or other exchange with the payers. Okay. And speaking of payers, um, are the services provided under Act 39, these end of life services, are those covered by insurance or, or not? I believe they are specifically required to be so I don't think there was a, I'm just skimming through here. Um, I don't think there is a requirement for them to be covered. So it may, it may depend. Um, and it may be that some of this conversation happens as part of, a, or these various conversations happen as part of a medical appointment that would be covered. Um, and so some of the processes may be sort of inherently covered in, in that sense but I don't know, for example, if the prescription medication um, that would be provided to hasten death is on a form, you know, on the, on the insurer's prescription drug formulary such that the regular cost sharing would apply or not. That would be something you might want to hear from um, providers about or from uh, pay the payers about. Uh, and there are, what they there are specific rules regarding um, uh, hospice care within Medicare that are different from right. This is not Medicaid. hospice. No, uh, no. But if if the individual were in hospice, that would be different. So anyway, or if they were in a, I'm thinking of a, um, a nursing home or other location. Okay. Go ahead, Jen. I don't have anything else. That That's it. it. We've got it all. Okay, so we do have we do have some questions. I will I'll circle back with uh, Senate Judiciary about the liability language to so that they can review that on our behalf, and then um, we'll want to hear from End of Life Choices and others uh, about the specific requests that are in the bill, uh, specific changes that are in the bill. And um, we'll get that on the agenda sometime fairly soon. So any questions, other questions, committee members? All right. I, Senator Lyons. Yep. Um, I, I guess I need a clarification as to what's clinically appropriate. You know, how is that defined? And is I'd like to have some discussion about that, perhaps with some of the providers or whatever. 
we can we can try to do that. You know, this is a the clinically appropriate definition is one that gets uh, it it becomes somewhat controversial, and so we'll we'll try to at least address it a little bit. But I don't know that we're going to resolve that one in our committee. We can try. Certainly understand the differences of opinion around it, uh, so we can uh, consider it. But good point, Senator. All right. Any other questions? I've written that one down. Okay.